Welcome to Arc and Postcast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well, Andrew. I'm doing well over here. How are you doing over there? Good. How's that side of the, uh, I'd say that side of the river, but I guess we're both in Ohio, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, it's that's uh, cats out of the bag there. Uh, it's been raining for the past couple of days. I mean, if anyone needs verification, I can tell it's thoroughly wet here. Excited about this episode, though. I can tell you that. I don't. I don't know why, but I just am. I know it's it's something that's cool. It's it's one of the big success stories, and it's always fun to talk about. And there's so much online about it. I'm I'm sure there wasn't exactly a dearth of information for you. So. Oh no. <laughs> no information out there <laughs> oh yeah no no not at all uh, but we do have a couple of uh, uh news items here if you just want to dive into those uh yeah do you want to pull them up i can lead off with some of the more boring updates at least yeah go 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 for it so so we've got a, a couple that are going to be coming down the pipe here uh just to keep tracking what's going on upstream uh, bitwarn rs released version 1.17 uh, which if you remember 1.16 jack was talking about them merging different architectures into one image uh, and they've done the same kind of concept here where they are merging database support into one single image so there's no specific uh, image for for mysql or, or postgres uh, when it comes for uh, this 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 bitwarn rs uh, image they only give us the base uh, major dot minor dot bug fix release. There are images like Nextcloud that give us major dot minor release, and it will automatically track the latest bug fix version. Uh, and that's that's preferable from my point of view because I know I'm always tracking the latest bug fix version of the second to latest minor version. So if I don't have that, I have to kind of code around it which typically isn't going to be that that big of a deal but it's still something yet another thing for me to take into consideration um and then another release uh that came out was camboard which is version 1.2.16 uh, now to give you an idea of how infrequent these releases are 1.2.15 got released on june 19th so these do not come out very frequently. I'd say probably to the tune of about four per year. Like the 1.2 version release has been out for... 1.2.0 was actually released December 26, 2017. Oh, so I was thinking, you know, 2018, we were seeing something, you know, late 20, late 2018, you know, 2019, maybe, you know, somewhere in June there. I didn't realize it was... Literally years. Coming up on three years. We're probably going to be tracking that just because we, we like Hamboard and it's at such a stable state. Um, and, and they don't do bug fix releases like a lot of other projects do. They incorporate just a lot of features and they incorporate a lot of upgrades. Uh, so I'm, I'm fairly confident with that. The last upgrade I have here is Nextcloud. Nextcloud 20 is actually now available. So, so major release. Uh, a couple different highlights in there, uh, notably Nextcloud Hub and Nextcloud uh, Chat, all which are touched down in this Tech Republic piece by Jack Wallen. And uh, going over Nextcloud here, he has a, a couple different points uh, to make about the most recent release. Uh, the first one being the dashboard. Now, if, if you're just using Nextcloud for file storage, like like I am mainly, um, if you're not using it for email, if you're not using it for your day-to-day, -day, your homepage, then this isn't really going to be that much of a benefit to you. Uh, the, the other cool thing about Nextcloud 20 is that the talk client, their chat yeah. client, uh, can now bridge to many, many, many third-party services, including Matrix. Now... Awesome. What did I say simply a couple episodes ago? I'm like, look, Nextcloud is doing this Federation stuff. They're going to get a little taste of it and they're going to like it. And they're just going to branch out from here. And sure enough, their their flagship chat client is now bridging with the most federated network on the planet, which is Matrix. Keep in mind, they're also able to bridge to Slack and IRC and Microsoft Teams and Mattermost. So they're, they are hitting a lot of the major players in the space. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting just because 
they're kind of taking that responsibility of doing everything at once instead of having one really good file storage, which, you know, which I think they have right now and I use and I enjoy, they have talk right now with a calendar and mail and they have all these services and what happens when they're all mediocre and come together then rather than, you know, being all great and coming together. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to see that. And, and to be fair, uh, I do have my next cloud set up to have my file storage like we were talking about. Yeah. I also have in it my email client. So my email client that's able to reach out to all my services and kind of centralize my email. I also have uh, a deck instance on Camboard. Yep. So it, what was the other thing? Oh, the uh, the, the calendar. Oh, and yeah. The calendar and the contacts. So, like, I yeah. keep my contact synchronization up to date with Nextcloud, and I keep my calendar synchronization up to date with Nextcloud. So, to be fair, it is kind of my social hub, but it acts for me more as a repository that my end clients access can talk uh, to. Right? Can talk them to. putting a, a front end in on top of this. You know, isn't necessarily a bad idea. I mean, if I log into a homepage and it has my calendar on it, like, what what my to do are today. It's already that, it's, right. It's not a bad idea, yeah. So uh, I, I want to see what changes to my workflow this would bring. Um, of course, we're not going to be rolling next cloud twenty until uh, twenty one comes out. Where uh, this will have us bump up to next cloud nineteen. Uh, so we're going to be running that now, testing a testing an initial rollout of that probably sometime around the end of the month, releasing two point five. And bumping up some of these these applications like Handboard, Nextcloud are going to be getting these new versions. That is it for all of the updates. Uh, there is another bit of Federation uh, information that I wanted to throw out there. Uh, Firefly three is now what is it? Tooting on on Mastodon. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. The <laughs> look you gave me. I was like, what is he saying over there? The, the, okay. Yeah, they're, they're okay. tooting now. So okay. uh, they are they are on uh, fostodon.org. Uh, FOSS, once again, free and open source software. The last thing here is a little bit of follow-up from what we were talking about uh, in the Freeze and Freedom episode a couple episodes ago. The, uh, the Free Software Foundation just turn 35 i i I wanted to narrow in on in this blog post that's linked their ways to celebrate their ways to celebrate is just to take action on what they've been talking about doing for the past 35 years like trying a fully free distribution of gnu slash linux because they can't just call it linux (laughs) take an hour to follow our email self-defense guide and learn how to opt out of bulk surveillance Download an experiment with GNU Emacs. So, no, 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 never mind. Don't do that. Use Vim. Use Vim. Just use Vim. <laughs> Get that one. Use LibreOffice instead of Microsoft Office. Use F-Droid in your, your Android device uh, as a third-party repository with yeah. hundreds of fun and useful free software apps. I'll tell you, that's worth it for exactly one application. Like I, I don't care whatever else you download off it. They got some other ones, cool ones I like. But that is useful for for one of them, and it is completely worth it for one of them. It's called New Pipe, and it is a YouTube client. You can use it to stream in the background with your phone turned off, like you Ooh. know, like you would when listening to music on your phone. Yeah, and it also allows you to download any YouTube video, <laughs> and it also has no ads. Ooh, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, it is. It is far and away the best experience YouTube has to offer. Yeah, it's 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 totally worth it because it just just installing after it and that'll keep it up to date too because it's a package repository. It's not like a third party, you know. You don't just install after it and then boom, it it, it will keep your applications a- up to date. It'll update, tell you yeah. about updates and stuff. Yeah, it's it is it is totally worth it just for that one application. But there's there's tons in there. There's there's Bitcoin Wallet. There's uh, Nextcloud clients. Right. And a lot of them are duplicated from the Google Play Store. And then you can also, with F-Droid, you can enable other repositories too. So they have their F-Droid official repository. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, when Matrix, the Matrix team were evaluating Element as their new application, uh, they set up their own little third party repository that they could push up to quicker than F-Droid would build for them. So, oh, so you awesome. were getting yeah. the latest and greatest 
uh, as, as fast were, as possible. Yeah, yeah, as they're developing it. Yep, yep. And the EFF, I believe, has their own separate uh, repository. And and there's one with like all these hacking tools. I think it's like Kali Linux or something like that. For what? It has like For, an uh, F Droid repository. Yeah, it's oh like all these like. All these sniffers and and crackers and wire shards yeah, on a for a, like a, an Android device, or yeah, like a phone, yeah, like, like an a Android, phone. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, oh, it's oh, so that's, fun. A, that's actually a pretty pretty useful tool to have there, doing some you know wireless network uh, sniffing. Oh yeah, no. When I was setting up my Wi-Fi and stuff, I used that all the time, trying to figure out if stuff was up and working or not, or if I can get to my router from certain networks. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, are are these ports open? Yeah, well, they shouldn't be. So let me go lock them down. You know, so. why is port eighty open on the router? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, uh, so congrats to FSF, and I hope them thirty five more fun filled years. I have one news item here. Believe it or not, I'll tell you what. This one's funny. I think this one's pretty funny. So I was looking at Bootstrap five, just got released. Era four point five. There five beta got released and I was like, oh man, we're, we're going to be uh, probably upgrading that pretty soon here just because we use bootstrap. And I was thinking, you know, why, why would we, why not be on latest and greatest? Obviously there's a lot more uh, into coming into play with that, but I was going through their release notes and I was looking at it and I was like, uh, okay, sounds good. You know, all this CSS and JavaScript stuff, they're actually a lot dropping a lot of JavaScript support, which I kind of think they need so it's not based off jquery fine whatever okay keep scrolling i get down to them dropping dropping support for jekyll and picking up hugo instead Oof. yeah Oof. so and i i think it's hilarious just because we did the jekyll episode and one of the things we mentioned in the jekyll episode was uh why would someone switch to a faster static site generator it's a static site generator and i am not joking when i say this it says from this blog post, Hugo, on the other hand, is written in Go, so it has a natural, no external runtime dependencies, and it's much faster. We build our current master branch site, including the document, the docs, uh, SAS, and CSS in 1.5 seconds. Our local server reloads in one in milliseconds instead of 8 to 12 seconds, so working on the docs has become a pleasant experience again. Obviously, they take a shot at Ruby and uh, uh, site generation, but I think it's hilarious how they mention these uh, load times for the server are milliseconds instead of 8 to 12 seconds. So so that time is interesting. And if you've ever been on a discourse forum and you're typing up a new post, you can see a preview of it in Markdown uh, render as you, yeah. as you type it. Now... That's all well and good, but there's a noticeable delay when when, sure. when that happens. Uh, what and I, I got this straight from Brian Lunduke, so shout out to him. What the human eye is is accustomed to seeing as real time is going to be around ten milliseconds. So if they're able to get their site generation down to milliseconds. You could almost live document in, oh, yeah. in your terminal as you, as you see the I'm site thinking, render in front of yeah, you. Two monitors, you know, you got your docs up on one that you're editing and your site up on the other. No, I'm, I'm sure it, when they say reloads in milliseconds, they mean reloading in hundreds of milliseconds. But sure, right. Still, that that's getting that's getting closer. That's that's pretty cool. We're getting there. If that's all I've got for news. Do we have any R Compose developments? No, we actually don't. Uh, we're we're gearing up for Linux Fest. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, there's going to be a big announcement there. Hint, hint. So, uh, uh, any any last minute stuff? Uh, we're trying to get in uh, and 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 test and and kind of stabilize everything that we got. We're going to have Jack alternatively jump into our integration discussion, which is on WordPress. Is it not? It is. Yep. Today I'm going to be talking about WordPress. I think we're going to be talking about WordPress um, only because I know we've talked about it before a little bit. For anyone who doesn't know or perhaps lives under a rock, WordPress is a content management system. Fun, maybe, but to me, not very much. Uh, it's written... <laughs> <laughs> You like that one? <laughs> wow. 
it's great. It does its job, but I, I, I don't know. I like playing with stuff out of the box and uh, this is just too like sit down and write a blog post. I, you know, I want some markdown or a little bit of flavor at least. This is very, you know, pick your head. What do you call it? Wiz- WYSIWYG. Yeah. Yeah. WYSIWYG. Yeah. It's a WYSIWYG. It's content management system. So it's great for, you know, putting out blog posts and content and uh, they have a million plugins, whatever. Uh, it's open source content management system written in PHP and MySQL. Great. If you like PHP and are from the 90s, this is perfect for you. MySQL. <laughs> I see you shooting that look over. <laughs> PHP, I'll tell you, PHP is my best friend as a sysadmin because oh, I can you like just it? go in and hack away at it, and it the feedback is instant, oh, right? Man. I can change I... whatever I want in there. If, if if there's a bug, I can log into the server, I can change the line, and it is instantly rendered, fixed. Yeah, and I I don't know I I've. I'm not talking down on PHP as a language, but for web stuff, it does dynamic content good and it's a basic interface to that server i always got lost on authentication and authorization with it because you i'm not saying you have to hand roll your own solution but you're, you're i feel like you're always kind of coming close with it written in php and mysql a lot of raw and direct to the sql database uh obviously if you're not a developer you're probably not going to be touching that and what I already touched on, it's used to create, manage, and modify digital content. So a lot of a lot of WordPress is blogs, is what I think of. You're not running, you're not typically going to run an e-commerce site. I mean, you can, but typically, you think I'm thinking blogs. You can do pretty much anything on a WordPress site. <laughs> you're not wrong. You are not wrong. <laughs> they have this. They have this very weird power dynamic between uh wordpress.com wordpress.org and automatic so automatic is the parent company of wordpress.com automatic is the people behind wordpress woocommerce gravatar tumblr i i I think it's a massive company so they run wordpress.com and wordpress.com is their hosting solution for wordpress.org which they help develop and run and maintain so wordpress.org is the open source project so it's kind of a weird, I wouldn't even call it triangle. It's automatic runs uh, WordPress.com and then the people at automatic develop for WordPress.org. I'd call that a triangle. Triangle. WordPress.com is using the software of WordPress.org to host. So yeah, <laughs> that is absolutely a triangle. This is right, right, right there, right there. Okay. Okay. So it, yeah, it is a weird, it's a weird triangle. I love their landing page. It's just, we are passionate about making web a better place. And then they list all their websites. And I'm just, I just, I'm just thinking to myself, okay, this is pretty cool. Uh, and then we, we don't make software for free. We make it for freedom. It's back to that triangle. That is a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but essentially without the contributions to wordpress.org, I think that wordpress.com would kind of be, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to call it stuck, but it'd be maybe stagnant. WordPress is used on a lot of websites a certain percentage of websites one might even say a third of all websites so that are we, are we gonna get are we gonna get uh actual numbers here do we need there's, a, do we need a drum roll for, for the- there is the big dispute because you and i have been i think misquoting this since the dawn of this podcast saying i think i i can pull up an instance of you saying 32 me saying like 38 me saying 35 I think I was at 60 at one point, but we're going to forget about that. <laughs> I think it was just pull a number in between, you know, 25 and 45 and just that's close enough for the day. But really, and I don't want to sound naive, but it, that's almost about what it, it's at. It's it's hard to track. It's hard to track the Internet. How, how do you know who's using what? But out here, W3 Techs, uh, it's a web technology survey company. They have a list out here of what percent of sites are using WordPress. So they have this diagram. I, I put a link to it in the uh, WordPress overview. But to explain it, uh, it says how to read the diagram. I know we're podcast, but Andrew and I love explaining diagrams on this, which I think is great. WordPress is used by 38.6% of all the websites. That is a content management system market share of 63.5%. 
So what you're saying is I was close with the 60%. Yeah, but <laughs> no. <laughs> the gray bar they have there is 38.6 of the internet. And then the uh, 63.5 number Andrew was talking about kind of poking at me is of CRM software that's out there. If you look at number two here, it's smoking Shopify, Joomla, and Wix by a mile. And I believe it. It's so easy. As much as I was uh, saying it's not my cup of tea, it's so easy to spin up a quick blog with WordPress. Well, and talk about ease of use. I mean, I know you were poking fun at it earlier, but it is literally just spinning up an instance and sitting down to write a blog post. You don't have to mess around with what Ruby environment do I have? You don't have to sit down and go, what, you know, is Go installed on the server? You don't have to say, you don't have to answer hard questions. You just have to say, hey, we're ready to go. You enter your website name here. We're off. Write a blog post and you're there. So it's absolutely great for anyone who wants just blogging software and they don't want to have to deal with the configuration management or any of the complex hard hard tasks that are there. Uh, it also offers themes. They offer a theme every year. You can customize it with images. The one I put in there is the 2010 theme of uh, the trees in the forest because that's I think that's literally everyone's favorite. My second is uh, 2017. So if if I'm not mistaken, they every year come out with like a yearly default theme. Right. That's the one for 2010. And I knew okay. we, because I remember a while back, like open source club back, we had talked about, oh yeah, you run into a problem. Then you find some random guy's blog post from who knows when. And it's got this picture <laughs> of this path with trees overhanging. I'm like, yeah, I see that all the time. <laughs> sure enough i you know i'm thinking there's this one guy out there that's got all these blogs or whatever that he's maintaining and i'm looking at I'm like oh it's just a wordpress theme that probably everyone's using <laughs> people haven't even bothered changing the default theme <laughs> have not changed it since <laughs> the themes they have plenty of and then wordpress.org has 55,487 plugins available you mentioned it earlier but WordPress can do anything. And I think that's kind of where we get where, where, where you get these plugins coming in. They can do you can stand up an e-commerce site on WordPress. There's a plugin basically for everything. I would love one day to see a WordPress site with all 55,487 plugins installed on it just because I think that would be pretty funny. It, there's a lot offered out there. WordPress 5 kind of hopping into the editors here came out with a massive editor change, which was the Gutenberg editor versus the classic editor. And with the Gutenberg editor, I don't know if it's just because of the day and age we're in, but it it's focused on a media rich yeah, editor, if you want to call it. With it, you're getting a lot more pictures, embedded media. I, I, for me, at least, it didn't feel like I was writing a blog post anymore. It felt like I was writing something for social media, which I, I didn't really enjoy or really like. The classic editor kind of gives you that, not text only, but there's going to be a bulk, a bulk of this is going to be text rather than, you know, picture. I was just thinking about my experience with the Gutenberg editor. The only way I can describe it, uh, and, and this is not referring at all to anything technical, but it feels like typing on a cloud, like as opposed to like typing in a box. Sure. Like if, if you're used to form software or or a terminal or anything in in the browser right that's it's going to be a lot of uh just typing in a box and you know click the bold button for bold and then you know click it again for not the, the regular you know php yeah. wig editor like that's yeah that's yeah. kind of what's been the grandfather of all the editors uh, going right. from there the the gutenberg editor breaks that almost completely like it has it has just this Maybe ethereality, if that's a word. I don't know. <laughs> like it's, you know, like it's, it's very, it's very. Oh, it just works. Like when I when I click sure. here to type it, it knows what I want to type a header there, and now it's a bold header, and then the next is a paragraph, and I can drag and drop a picture, and it doesn't put it in some kind of weird place. It like puts it in the next thing, and then gets me ready to type like the description of it or or whatever. It's just very. It makes a lot of assumptions for me. Which I'm not necessarily a, a opposed to, especially if I just want something really quick and off, off the hip. But for most of my typing, I'm, I'm writing technical documentation and I'm doing it in a very conscientious sort of way, which that is not geared towards. Yeah, and I maybe that's what I was trying to get at as well. I, I'm in the same boat. 
I'm writing technical documentation or technical blog posts that follow a certain flow. I'm not trying to share what I did over the weekend. Maybe maybe you could spin up a WordPress site where you do talk about what you did over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's all i have for wordpress i, I you know i, I was kind of easy i was kind of easy on it i have to admit yeah you were do you want to do you want to hit it with anything or do you want to like uh the one thing i'm taking away from this i'm I'm only describing everything in uh what is it instead of percents as uh fractions one one third because that way you can be ambiguous with it yeah. rather than you know it's about about a third Versus, about a third of the internet. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. About a third of the internet. All right, I'll just use that from now on. Then that's that's fine. I think WordPress is another one of those topics up there with Nextcloud and Canboard that getting into customizations. There's no end in sight, is what I'd say. Not only that, but the ecosystem is is so much far beyond what Nextcloud's reach or or Rundex reach that it's not. You know how can you do it? It's how uh, how many other people have done it before you, right? Right, and and has it turned out to be a good idea? Like you can do case study after case study on WordPress, um, and and you, that that user base obviously op- open source software wants a big user base, and there's good reason for that because with a big user base brings a whole bunch of stability, right? People, you're getting a lot of eyes, not just on the code but on the functionality. Definitely. So it's about that time. It's it's just about Ansible time. Ansible low clock. And uh, anyone who knows me uh, knows that that this is probably the thing I'm I'm most passionate about. Uh, stumbled across it, you know, way back in the day, and have literally not strayed from it since since I did. Um, I I think I actually discovered Ansible right after the flip to 2.0. So I never really had to deal with the, the idiosyncrasies of uh, what came before and then all the, the breaking changes that they made at that time. Yeah, that, I know that one to two jump was a big one. There was definitely some disillusionment because they were making a lot of good changes, but there were a lot of breaking changes. And if you're a sysadmin using a tool to manage all the other stuff that breaks, you don't want that tool to break too. <laughs> That just sounds like a nightmare right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It definitely earned itself a little bit of ill will at that point. Uh, but I believe a lot of what they did was was good for their internal standardization. We were talking about tech debt. I mean, they had to fix a lot of the tech debt that they created just to get that tool out, right? And that was part of the, the one to two uh, switch as well. So, uh, I mean, honestly, I, if I can be candid here, I still know people who run Ansible 1.9. Just because they wrote their scripts, it works. They still have a working install. Just works kind of thing. Uh, un- until Python 2 goes into life. I mean, they're going to be able to keep using that. Oh, wait. It already did. I was going to say. Okay. Yeah. I'm sitting here wondering like, wait, I thought, what, what's the date for EOL? I thought it already was, but you're sitting over here. Oh, wait. <laughs> Yeah, this is not an intro to Ansible talk. I know a lot of our integration discussions have been introductions to this and yeah. that, the other thing. Uh, this is not going to be an introduction to Ansible. This is going to be focused on a very specific topic. This is more so what you would need to know if you did all your research at 2.0 and then never looked at it again. Like, what are, what are the biggest changes? You know, what how, how do you keep up with these changes? And where do you find where to keep up with these changes? So I'm going to go through a little bit of that. Uh, now, this is a talk that I'll be giving at the Ohio Linux Fest uh, 2020. It's one that I also gave in 2019. Obviously, there's a lot updated for, for 2020. I think there were three new minor versions that came out. So there's a lot to discuss there. My talk is entitled Delta Ansible, Keeping Up With Changes and Deprecations. So I'm just going to dive right in here. There is a, a overview I wanted to go through. We're going to talk about three different things. The first is going to be velocity, the second currency, and the third sustainability. So we're talking about velocity. We're going to talk about releases and support. We're going to be talking about new features. And as well, we're also going to be talking about the deprecation cycle. So we're going to be talking about how fast Ansible developments happen and 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 what that means for us. The next is currency. Now, I'm not. I'm not talking about Bitcoin here. Uh, I'm talking about you know. Are you talking about Dogecoin or I'm Monero? Not, I'm not. Nor Litecoin neither. Right. I'm talking about <laughs> Bitcoin Cash. Well, I could talk about Bitcoin Cash. Oh no, 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 to. no! Please, no. <laughs> talking about. <laughs> so what you're referring to is Bitcoin is actually Bitcoin Cash. 
Oh, no, no, do not. No, we're not getting into this right now. <laughs> uh, but to talk about currency, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, what what was the starting point uh, of, of here? And like I said, we're going to be talking mainly about 2.0 and onwards. You know, what are what are the biggest hurdles that that I personally face and as well as failures and successes? So we're kind of going to go through some of my real world history there and then apply the sustainability next to what we've been doing so what what is a workflow that's that's going to work uh, to to keep ansible uh, up to date to track those those changes and deprecations you know uh, and and what are your best practices and and how to code as a business decision rather than a a in in the dark corner of the office let's take a look here starting off with velocity and, and velocity as we all know is is how quickly in which direction so let's let's set our pace with this velocity discussion so ansible has a releases and support page where they list all of the releases uh, that they currently have and their support model for them i do have a corresponding slide deck for this so this is this is going to make a lot less sense without that in the background I believe my 2019 talk is up somewhere and you can follow along there or I'll try to upload this as best I can. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, okay. Do you think it's on a WordPress site somewhere? There's a one third chance that it is. <laughs> <laughs> Ansible will publish their releases and support. And and what that means to us is, is mainly minor versions. So if we, if we take a look at the, the minor versions that Ansible had back in 2019, because uh, that's when the slide is from, they had 2.8 as their latest release. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that the Ansible developers are, are working on, right? They, they are still supporting other versions. So their, their frame of reference is to support the last three versions, stable versions, as well as one development version. So their development version is obviously them gearing up for their next minor version release. And their three previous minor versions are at different levels of support. The latest stable version will be supported with both security and general bug fixes. Sure. Now, if we go a little bit older, then that's going to be the next release, which is 2.7, which is supported with security and critical bug fixes. Now, that's kind of up to the developers to figure out what a critical bug fix is. They have their own internal determinations to make for that, but any critical bug fixes will be applied to two minor releases back. Uh, and then the third back would be 2.6 in this case, which was supported only with security fixes. So okay. only if there was a security vulnerability, which of course Ansible is, is transmitting you know sensitive information over either the web or, or at least over the network. So however that comes out, if there's a vulnerability, 2.6, you know, that being the third supported version, would get those security fixes. Everything else at that point is unsupported. There is no backporting of security fixes even that would be applied to them. So you are, you are stuck at that point in time if there's a, a vulnerability and you're using an out-of-date release, you either accept that or you upgrade. And it's not always keep updating because Ansible will keep several versions behind supported for you. You just got to make sure that you do your due diligence when keeping up there as well. Yeah, I like it. It gives you that time frame. You usually give any OL time frames. Yeah, the three last stable versions. Yeah, so if you're on, still on 2.6 and you know it's been 10 years, six years, whatever their development cycle is, you're stuck. Six months, but yeah. Oh, they release a, a new stable version every six months? Oh, how about that? Yeah, but before that, and, and actually leading up to that, is their roadmap. What is a roadmap? And a roadmap is obviously what's coming up next, and Ansible is no exceptions, right? So they list all the new functionality. Uh, they're grouped into minor version releases, so you can tell what is being planned for which release coming up. Releases are, are dated and categorized, right? So it's very easy to parse. Along with the roadmaps are their porting guides, and their porting guides are very, very well written. They're very straight to the point, and they they showcase functionality as it pertains to the latest release. I like that. It'll show you how to remediate as well as how to take advantage of new functionality in playbooks. 
it is it is just really well and they hit almost every single major functionality that is that is put in into the release i mean it's it's how i kind of stay up on you know what's the latest way to do x or y right it, it'll show you in the porting guides as you walk through them right and uh, it, it also includes deprecation notes. So now along with new functionality, you're also going to get deprecation of old functionality. So that's also something to be aware of. And I do have a, a demo of what a roadmap looks like. Uh, and they include all of the, the dates where you would be at a, a specific function, yeah. right? So like uh, they're always developing on the, the Devel branch, Dev the devil branch. branch. Yeah. And at some point they would freeze that branch and branch that off. So the first one that they're going to release is the alpha one, right? And then they're going to do a community freeze. Uh, and then after their alpha, they're going to do a beta. And then after their beta, they're going to do as many release candidates as they need before releasing the point zero release. Uh, so on their roadmap, that takes them about a month and a half to do. How about that? A month and a half is about no time. Just about no time at all. Which is good to hear because honestly, you you get the tale of uh, two shops and it's one that releases it when they're ready, which ends up being about... Two years past due, I'll tell you that. Right. And then you have the uh, shops kind of like Ansible where it's, well, we're going to just write as much as we can. And then in six months, we're going to tag this thing and it's going to be out the door. Yep, release early, release often. Yep. So it's good, especially, you know, the one thing that would kind of trip me up, which I liked hearing from you, was the uh, backwards compatible. Well, I don't know if you've mentioned, talked on backwards compatible, but it's the uh, upgrade documentation they have. The, the porting guides, yes. Porting guide, yeah. And I think that's absolutely necessary. Yeah, and uh, so, so actually talking about those porting guides, right, so... I do have a, a little snippet in here. I mean, it's it's really fun because they, they give you a, a broad overview and, and I'll go into how the they, they kind of showcase it. But yeah. they do they do give you the like old way to do things and like then this is the new comparable way to, to write yeah. this. Or or if yeah. it's a broader architecture scope, right, they'll walk you through examples of, of how you would set something up. Uh, so there's there's a lot that goes into these porting guides. I think because they learned from their their one to two migration that people really care about the changes <laughs> that they need to make and being a, aware of those. So they've they've really put a lot of effort into it, and it shows. And it is it is ultimately super helpful. So um, I'm happy with that. Uh, and then also. The downside is the deprecation cycle, right? So their porting guides will alert you to deprecations uh, as you you go through, right? And they'll they'll list either deprecations within modules or deprecations in the the broader engine, the Ansible engine itself. Now, if if a feature is to be deprecated, there is a process that it goes through. Once again, they learn their lesson the first time. So the first step is that the features marked as deprecated accompanied by three things, which is a warning to the user, alternatives to switch to, as well as a release when the feature will be removed indefinitely. During the actual runs of the playbooks, there will be output that will say, warning, you're using a feature that is marked as going to be deprecated. Yeah. Uh, move away from it by this release uh, by taking this action. So, so they will, I, I, typically they'll also include like either a link or like a C also where you can go and, and find out more information. Uh, but they do include all of that in every single run you do. So if you have something, if you're currently using something that's being deprecated, it will give you a very loud warning. Clear. That, yeah. A clear idea. Oh man. This is something that you need to address. Uh, oh, so it is good. removed yeah. in the fourth future release. So okay. by that, that a point, bug, are those bug fix releases or is that a uh, minor update, minor, minor, minor upgrade? Yeah, really. Okay. Uh, removed okay. in the fourth uh, feature. So like minor, minor version. Release. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. AKA minor version. Yep. So for example, something deprecated in 2.5 will be removed completely in 
if you're thinking Ansible develops in six month intervals, that's a quick turnaround. Well, you're going to have two years. And that's also something that you can make the decision to move to because you can stick on two five without support. Yeah. Like for however long you want. Right. Anything. Yeah. Right. Um, but ultimately you're, I guarantee you're going to run into some kind of incompatibility either as operating systems or, or the, the broader yeah, ecosystem yeah. moves on or as, you know, there's just something in Ansible that you need to do and it's, that's in a future version. Next, I wanted to touch on currency, which is how to, how to become current, how to catch up to where Ansible is from where you are. And I, I found this found this picture of a guy driving a, a Model T, like an old old Model T Ford. Yeah. The cool thing about this is that I, I mean he's got like no seatbelt, he's got no doors, uh, he's got just like the steering wheel. I, I can't imagine what the pedals are made of, but they were smart enough by that point to add a windshield. So okay. so so at least they <laughs> they've done you know that little small improvement that someone get hey. You know what? I could probably stop all the bugs from getting in my mouth if we we put up a windshield here, right? <laughs> so it's it's actually getting him to where he needs to go better than what he was using before, oh, right? Oh, for sure. You know, but it there's there's so much improvement you can make, right? And and that's kind of where we were when when the the Brado ecosystem was at 1.9, right? There was there were a lot of improvements to be made, but it worked. But it needed to be a lot better, right? It's no Tesla, I'll tell you that. And, and some of the biggest hurdles was tools in that you're trying to go back before the starting point. I mean, where, where are you coming from, right? right? Whether if you're using a configuration management tool like, like Chef or uh, Puppet was huge in the ecosystem before Ansible really landed. To get from using those tools to using another one, you have to consider what well, we talked about DevOps before, right? What are the people and the processes and the tools looking like, right? Sure. You, you are going to have to, if you change one of those up, you're going to have to touch the others because they all work in harmony. You can't just pull the rug out of one of them and expect everything else to function just fine. Right. Okay. So, so even though we, we kind of make fun of, of people who are clinging on to old legacy tools, it could be that it's integral to the workflow and the, 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 the cohesity among the team. But this is all a, a maturation process. So as, as you grow or as you face new challenges, sometimes you are going to have to switch things up, right? And it's uh, if you do it right, it, it can benefit you immensely. The, the, the biggest hurdles, right, I, I think could, be, could end up being the processes, right? Um, so in, in thinking about the processes, I pulled up a, a picture of the old Smith Brothers Hardware Company yeah. in Columbus, which is a, a old building that was used for you know, way, way back in the day for hardware manufacturing, right. Which is now been repurposed as a, a kind of general space that, that, you know, people, people can use for, for whatever else they need. It's not necessarily for hardware anymore, right. It's, it's being used for, for other purposes. Right. But if you think about it, the bones of the building are still there, right. You're still dealing with, you know, if you haven't replaced it yet, the old, uh, internals of the building. You're still looking at the old external. Obviously, the sign's still on there. You know, you got stuff on the roof that I'm sure hasn't been touched in decades. And you know, you you, you still got the the bones of that building there. Just like in any kind of legacy environment, you're still going to have the bones of decisions that were made previously. You're still going to have the ramifications of the little one offs and the little little caveats that were thrown in there just to make things work. Right. Um, so that's that's known as a, a, a brownfield environment, whereas, you know, if we're, you're spinning things up in the cloud, you're going to be faced with a, a, a more greenfield environment, which is ultimately way better because you can make the decisions without having the legacy bones to deal with. You don't have someone else's problem that was handed to you is what you're saying. Yeah, basically. Yeah, you get to create your own problem for someone else. <laughs> Yeah. One might even I'm, say, <laughs> "I'm free to make my own mistakes for someone else to deal with." <laughs> so, so yeah, legacy legacy environment, but along with legacy environment comes legacy mindset. Um, and sure. and there's a lot of silos in IT today. That and 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 don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people who are working on busting that 
uh, for instance, uh, Packet Pushers has a really great podcast that that do that 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 aim to break down those those silos and and teach people a multidisciplinary approach to to problems. And and one of those things as as you mature as you start to break down those silos is taking a look at other people's stuff. And we were talking this at, at DevOps too. I mean, that's a very scary thing to do, to be that exposed, right? Uh, especially when it comes to the the scripts, right, that you're running and, and you know, how your, the little hacks you made in order to make your job easier, right? Having to, having to share that and get that out into the, the broader team is, is very scary, but it's absolutely necessary if you want to move past these legacy issues that you have, right? You need to up these processes. You need to standardize these processes, whatever you can do to get them to the point where they are available to more people than the SME. We talked a lot about that with Run Deck as well. Yep. So I think those are the, the biggest hurdles, but along with along with the code, right? So So taking that and running with it, Code actually needs to be treated like code, whether it's scripts or, you know, whether it's one thing that's that's hanging out on the jump post out there or 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 someone's laptop, which is probably the worst place to have it. Oh, gosh. Why? But you need to you need to treat code like code. You need to review it. You need to test it and you need to version it and bringing this back to Ansible. Ansible yeah. is code. Ansible is absolutely code. Ansible may be configuration management, but it is absolutely code. Don't let anyone tell you anything differently. It needs to be reviewed like code. It needs to be tested like code, and it needs to be versioned like code. There's there's no two ways around it. <laughs> I won't I won't bear any. Uh, now now there are a couple things that are optional, uh, like like following best practices, right? I I it's it's. It's necessary to get it at a level where you're reviewing it and testing it and versioning it, right? To, to some extent. I don't, I don't care right. what it is. To some extent, right. it needs to be at least reviewed, tested, and versioned. But the best practices, like when it comes to uh, specifically with Ansible, ignoring errors, right? Or or formatting YAML like like uh, inline versus versus the actual YAML hierarchy, the, the white right. space delineated the hierarchy, those things are best practices, which you should be working towards and your review process, your testing process should be pushing you in that direction. Um, and, and obviously where, where you come along, you know, and, and start implementing that you're going to find clutter, right? You're going to find clutter inside of your scripts and you're just going to find clutter scripts. My favorite is, is I found, I found a, a couple scripts, you know, uh, in one of them in the scripts directory is called fdisk sda omg are you sure dot yaml no i'm not sure what what is that <laughs> should i run it don't think so um the next one is in the uh, playbooks 2.3.1 directory it was called extend vg dot yaml dot omg underscore do underscore not underscore use <laughs> nice okay no reason to be keeping that around. That's clutter. That's clutter. Now, I, I understand the mentality. Don't delete anything, right? Sure. The minute you version control it, those are gone, right? The minute right. you version control it, if you need to reference something, you reference it in the history. You don't reference you it in an archive directory. So what, what are some ongoing acti- or opportunities that I, I see with, with Ansible here? Well, uh, the one is to revisit code. Tech debt. Yeah, it's tech debt. It's absolutely tech debt. We went over tech debt. It, yeah. Yeah. It's what it if something's not to. working, you got to go revisit it. Or if right. something's shooting you a deprecation warning, you're going to want to go revisit it. You should probably take a look at that. Yeah. If something, and, and this is more advanced topic too, but if something's throwing a, a formatting warning, right? If it's not in, in correct YAML or, or, you know, ideal YAML. Then you're going to want to go revisit it, right? And sometimes you're going to want to go revisit it for the heck of it to make sure the assumptions that you made back then still hold true now. <laughs> That's a big one right there. That's a big one right there. Yeah. It's a little bit more than fixing what's broken. It's it's making sure everything is operating correctly, which is a little bit more hands-on in depth. Yeah, it's a lot more than looking at code. Yeah. 
Uh, one of the things is uh, making sure you're being informed of new modules, right? Sure. Um, is there a better way to do something? I know I've got a script out there that reboots a server that was built before the reboot module came along. And I want to go back and change that to use the reboot module because that's what that's for. I don't have to do like I had trickery that I had to figure out in order to yeah. do that. I don't I don't I'm not going to have to do that anymore. So I need to go back and revisit that. Um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, and, and I experienced a little bit of this firsthand, you can do pretty much anything with line and file and raw. If you just need to run commands and change <laughs> configuration files, you are going to be very, very tempted just to use those two and nothing else. Don't. All right. First of all, <laughs> look at the new modules that are coming out, right? Do a little bit of research. Find out if there's something that someone else did that's going to make your life easier. And then the the way you do that on new code that's going in to make sure that you're getting that is code reviews, right? So you can't know everything, but you have other people with other skill sets and knowledge bases that can probably help you at one point in your life or another. You, I mean, you can't know what to evaluate without knowing what's there in the first place, which is why code reviews are, are so important. Updating your standards. Uh, we're going to go over this, but like if, if we have a lot of with items conditionals, right? We're going to want to replace those with loops because the standard is to use loop. Another standard is using the YAML format instead of the key equals value one-liner format. Right. Once again, making your code a little bit more readable, bringing everyone on the team up to the same level and saying, hey, l let's level set. We're all using this now. Let's go back and, and fix the stuff. And then we can always expect to see this setup. We can always expect it this way. Um, and, and a way to do that is to keep internal snippets and examples with boilerplate of commonly yeah. used idioms. Like if I need to loop over some, some things, I'm going to have like a uh, default shell command and use loop and then, you know, the items and, and put the item here and stuff like that. So, so if I ever forget, I forgot how I needed a loop. I can go back to that boilerplate and say, all right, what is the standard that we have for looping? And, and it's documented in that code. Some of the cool things about Ansible, <laughs> one of my favorite thing is most of the stuff just works. Yeah. TM. Um, uh, even new versions. New versions usually just work. You know, talking about, talking about uh, compatibility. I mean, they, they really are good with making sure that they don't have a whole bunch of breaking changes. Once again, they learned their lesson back in the day. They don't implement that many breaking changes. The hard way. The hard way, yeah. 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 And when they do, they, they flash you giant warning signs along the way. So, uh, and that's more of a testament to, to Ansible than, than anything I do. Um, now, a, a way to, to mitigate some of the really heartbreaking issues, right, is to, to limiting focus to defined standards, right? And it lets us make assumption to cleaning up that code, you know, and, and whether that's, that's community wide or, or just, Team wide, right? It, that's important to, to level set. Um, and once again, you do that in code review, enforceable. The last main section here I wanted to go over was the sustainability, which to me is implementing repeatable processes, right? So, so how do we do that? Now, this gets into the run discussion that we had a lot, so I'm not going to rehash this a lot. Uh, but this is where we start talking about automation front ends and testing and uh, what our environment looks like. Yeah. Right? Uh, so one thing I want to make sure we don't do is, you know, run Ansible on our own laptops and says works for me and push code up. Like that's, that's not good enough. I'm sorry. That doesn't sound good. Hey, set up your, uh, set up a run deck uh, automation front end, man. That's kind of, that's kind of my idea, right? Because yeah. well, 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 servers, uh, jump hosts, Jump host servers do do serve a, a, a different function where, you know, I, we, we can have a central point where we can have an environment set up to run our automation off of and we can do centralized login there. But the problem is that no one can see what each other is doing, right? Right. Except each other, if each other is using the same service account to run Ansible. 
And then no one knows who ran Ansible with the service account because you're all using the same service account. So that is a self-defeating purpose right there. So, and, and plus, I love the CLI. I love the CLI. Yeah. For maybe doing the same thing once or twice. I am, I, I don't want to, I don't want to live in it to run Ansible scripts and have it just sitting there going. Now, to be fair, it is the easiest way to do troubleshooting. It is not the easiest way for me to run a two hour script that I want to be passing off to someone else. Right. Um, we, and we talked about why automation front ends are important in our last episode, but this is where it really shines is where you can give everyone access. You can see what other people are doing, right? You're not using your laptop. You're using a, a safe uh, way to, to execute your scripts and you're going to need an automation front end with that. Uh, that's going to have a web UI and that's going to have a rest API. Um, and it's going to source results in a, in a data store that can give you reporting like pff, reporting. That's, that's so far yeah. beyond running scripts in a, command server like a like right. a jump post like right. that's that's next level stuff where you can start improving your processes based on actual feedback you can't have that unless you start parsing log files and ew who wants to do that this is there's there's so much you can get into with with front ends and, and the ability for them to handle so much that's being thrown at them right and and it's you know keep in mind it's lego pieces right so you can swap out whatever you need to if you need a different automation front end that's fine right if you need a different kind of data store that result, reports your results that's great right but try to get try to get these things set up in order to start having this functionality in front of you right you can you can swap it around however you want as long as you can get that out and and the one thing I wanted to drill down into is the reporting because we, we talked about the front end API, right? Why the report? Well, the report is actually part of the the integration testing we were talking about, right? So if you're if you're running jobs over and over and over again and they fail and fail and fail and fail and fail, you're going to want to know that. You're going to want to know that so you can improve it, right? Especially if it fails on the same part or for the for the same reason. Uh, so that you can start improving your scripting, not just fighting fires. You want to lessen the time you spend in front of your computer. Well, you don't have to fight legacy code either, at, you know, as you look at it. And it's also about improving processes too. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have process errors and you're going to have playbook errors, right? Now, if you're, if you're running an automation front end, you're not going to have that many process errors because you're going to be feeding it the right input. Right. Right. You're going to have those guardrails for you. Um, but the, the playbook errors, you're going to want to know what you're running into, especially if you're running against a legacy environment with a whole bunch of disparate servers and, 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 and various, various configurations. You're going to want to make sure that your automation is able to handle all of the, the, the functionality around that. So, so what does a report actually look like? Well, when you're, when you start talking about unit testing, and, and I know I lost a lot of people right there, right? Oh, man. But if, if we start thinking about what is what is unit testing? Well, it's running our automation and expecting it to succeed. That doesn't sound as scary, does it? Doesn't it? Sound, it doesn't sound like unit testing. It just sounds like running, it running does. a script. Yeah. It, it absolutely does. So that was that is the first step to unit testing. If you can get that, you're already... I'd say you're probably halfway there, halfway to where you need to be, not halfway to where you could be, but halfway where you need to be, right? So if you look and see that, specifically take the example of using different environments. If I can run a playbook on Ansible version 2.8 and then 2.9, but it fails on 2.10 over and over, and I can prove that like with three or four different runs against a whole bunch of servers, I'm going to have to figure out why, right? But at least I'm going to know that that playbook failed on that version for some reason, right? And especially like, so So for me, my most important scripts are the ones to build a server and the ones to patch a server. Right. If I can go through those and test those and say, okay, it works for this, the, this setup and it works for this setup but not, you know, another setup – then I have a little bit of peace of mind. Okay, I can I can operate in this section, but there's something I need to address for this other thing. And we can start going through these and have these being tested. Now, that brings us into the test functionality and, and how to do that. Um, so 
there's there's a couple things you would want to do when you start testing a playbook. Me, I prefer to test roles because a lot of my a lot of my functionality is actually is in roles and they're they're smaller, they're meant to be self-contained and they're they're easier to to dial in on. If I if I have a playbook fail, I don't want to spend time parsing through all of everything that's in that playbook, right? I just want to get to exactly what failed at, at some point, right? I also I also don't want to be limited uh, and and find out that something else failed within that playbook after I fixed the initial issue, right? And since the roles can be ran individually, I can kind of separate them out and run them as is. Yeah, I think that's a big point there that you're able to run them individually. Mm-hmm. You don't have to sit there and run everything all at once every single time to test it. You can break it out and run it one at a time. The things I'm looking for where I'm testing is obviously one module failures to increase the level of verbosity. I would probably also want to be looking for any kind of warning, right? So if I'm getting feedback that there's, there's a deprecation warning in this module, I don't necessarily want to indicate a failure, but I want to indicate some kind of a, Hey, this is going to need attention. Right. This is, and then if you if you see that on a graph of, of subsequent versions, you say warning, warning, failed. I bet you I could tell you what failed. <laughs> I bet you you let a deprecation go too long, and now we got a non-working playbook over here, non-working role. Working working through those is is helpful to so you can start seeing the you know how that how that's going. So so your your reporting software is going to get your day to day right. You're going to see if. If in the real world experience, you're running into a lot of issues with the the various roles you have just, just as they're being executed naturally, and then specific testing frameworks can let you know whether there's warnings or deprecations or actual errors in the roles that are coming up, especially ones that don't get touched a lot. You know, there may be a script that gets run, you know, once a quarter, you know, or, or once a year. Right. It's not you t- want to right. make sure that doesn't fail when you need it to run. In order to adjust the best practices, go back and review the code. Now, I, I know I seem like I'm harping on this. I, I, I promise you I am because that is the most important thing you can do is get someone else's eyes on the code. And and sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need a, a fresh new perspective uh, or, or a way to optimize that you know you, you hadn't looked into before. Or even if it's bringing a problem to you that you you evaluated previously and thought wasn't a problem and then someone's coming to you and saying hey it's actually turned out to be a problem problem. you can't stick to your guns and say no you're lying it's not a problem you you, you're going to have to start listening to other people and the way to get other people talking the most effective way i've found is is for them to take a look at at stuff you're adding in or stuff you're changing so review code go back through it take a look at it share it with your team and, and anyone else who's interested too. They're going to learn stuff and, and you're going to get eyes on your code. Everyone kind of benefits there. There's one last thing I wanted to hit on in sustainability. And that is if you don't get buy-in from the business, right? your team is not going to get time to do code reviews. Your team is not going to get the money or the access to set up an automation front end. We live in a society. You're going to have to convince people that this is worth it. And and here are three points to do that. I hear a lot, if it ain't broke, don't sure. fix it. Right. And 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 that's a that's a mantra to live by. I mean, I'm not I'm not knocking that by any means. But what is broke? Is broke when your playbook only works a third of the time? Yeah. <laughs> You know, does it have to work 100% of the time? You know, is is broke when you're using an unsupported version, right? What what does broke look like? Start redefining broken and you will have a myriad of reasons why this setup is absolutely necessary. If if you need to, I mean, manually start taking a look at, you know, what, what are my test results? How can I start doing a, a little bit of testing to show that stuff is actually broken, Right. Uh, you know, our, our code coverage, right? Maybe we're, we're running three different playbooks when we can run one, right? That's, that's broken in the sense that it's taking me an hour to do something that should take me five minutes. Is that broken? I, yeah, to me, for, for me, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Redefine broken if it ain't broke. 
Uh, the next one is that complexity is bad. The only way you're going to be able to to simplify it, right, to make to make your team happy so that they can read your code, um, the only way that you can make your your manager happy by giving him a repeatable process, right? The only way you can make the security team happy is by reducing the complexity in your code. So if, if you think you don't need this, take a look at your code and then explain to me exactly what that does in, in five sentences or less, right? And, and if you can't, sit back and say, okay, well, is all of this needed? Yeah, where, right? where, where do we need to step back here? Where do we need to, to reevaluate? Okay, I don't need this huge blob. How can I make this simpler? Right. Um, it also increases the bus factor too. I mean, your teammates aren't going to love you if you're the only guy that can do something. You're going to not love it when you're out in the Bahamas and you get a call from work. If exactly. I were to ever to go to the Bahamas, <laughs> but you're going to have to, you're going to have to, to get rid of that some complexity. And, and some of that is going to be your hubris, right? It's going to be, well, I made this thing work back when we didn't have that functionality and it's working just fine right now, right? It ain't broke. Let's step back. What is broke again? What, yeah. you know, is it broke when no one else can fix it but you? Yes. It is absolutely broken at that point. Lastly, passing the buck. So how do you, how do you stay within support, right? Or, or why, why do you stay within support? Why not just use an unsupported version, right? You, you, you're always going to have that job security and say, hey, you know what? It, it's broken. Give me a sec. Give me a sec. It's supported. Let me call someone, right? you're going to have that availability and that's something that you can always fall back on. And that's especially, you know, important if you're going to be in those critical environment situations, if you have infrastructure that needs to be up, I mean, right. you, you can't have a tool that doesn't function if, if you have that requirement. So, so to say, to say supported, stay within support. It's, it's always better to have someone to fall back on. Right. Even, even if like me, you're just an Ansible, you know, genius, right? You're just a, a <laughs> prodigy, right? You, you're 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 gonna run into some issues sometime. Better to have someone to fall back on than not. Someone's at least there to catch catch you. Yeah. What do we expect to have as a result of of all of this? Of of all we talked about, you know, we we talked about the the currency, we talked about sustainability, uh, we talked about velocity. Right. What what do we expect is at the end of the day? And the big question, is it worth it? So I think it's worth it in money. I think it's worth it in time. And I think it's worth it in energy. It's worth it in money simply because I'm doing the job of what used to be two or three full-time employees and getting compensated for it. It's worth it in time because I'm doing what used to take two to three full-time employees to do. It's worth it in energy because I'm I'm not just pouring energy into the systems. I'm pouring my energy into learning better practices, communicating with my team, and sharing my knowledge with other people. And I think that's the best thing that I can do with my time and my energy. And at that point, the money becomes a side effect of it. There is there's nothing I can do better than to keep up with these changes and deprecations in Ansible. So as we've seen today, open source technology is becoming more and more important by the day. We need to understand where it's at and where it's going, and most of all, push it forward in the right direction. And we can't do that without your help. So in order to grow and share the show, you can donate to the podcast at arkhampostcast.com. That allows us to get this show out to those who need to hear it. But for now, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks.